Welcome students to senior teleclass on Tech TV. And today we are discussing topic on electric chemistry. And your teacher is Thomas Asare Buedu. And we are going to look at introduction to chemistry today. And we discuss why chemistry is a science subject, and then why do we study chemistry? So we look at the aims or our objectives of studying the chemistry at SHS or in general. And by the end of the class, I expect students to be able to know why chemistry is studied as a science subject. And number two, we will know the aims of studying chemistry. Again, we shall know the branches of chemistry studied at SHS level. And then we will also know how to demonstrate knowledge of laboratory safety rules. And we look at some few definitions. And the first definition is, what is science? We have so many definitions for science. And science simply means systematic study of nature, in which chemistry is a very important branch of science. So when we talk about systematic, you know there are certain steps that we follow to study things. We try to look at what is this, how this was formed, or what is happening. And chemistry is an aspect of science. So chemistry is defined as experimental study, experimental study of the composition of substances or matter, then the effect of one substance on another. So if you look at experimental composition, experimental, we have the substance and we try to find out what makes that substance. Then when we combine two substances, what will be the effect? Let's look at this. If I put sodium chloride, as we used to call common salt in the homes, in water, what will happen to it? You see that it will dissolve. And when we put the same sodium chloride in kerosene, you see that it will remain undissolved. If, on the other hand, we put, say, naphthalene into kerosene, what will happen? We we'll see that naphthalene in kerosene will dissolve. But when we put that naphthalene into water, naphthalene will remain the same. So the question is, what makes up the sodium chloride and water? That sodium chloride is able to dissolve in water, but naphthalene is not able to dissolve in water. What is the composition of sodium chloride and kerosene? That sodium chloride could not dissolve in kerosene, but naphthalene dissolve in kerosene. So that is chemistry. We do experiment to find out why certain things or effect of one thing on another. And that is basically uh, chemistry. So why do we study chemistry? You look at the aims of studying chemistry. Students, so we have been from your JHS level, be your teachers told you something about chemistry, chemistry, chemistry. But we want to find out why do we study chemistry at all. There are three basic aims of studying chemistry. And our first aim is that we try to discover about the behavior of different kinds of matter. As I illustrated, or I made you to understand. When we put sodium chloride into water, what will happen? When we put sodium chloride into kerosene, what will happen? When we put 
naphtaline into water, what will happen? When we put naphtaline into kerosene, what happens? So we try to discover about the behavior of different kinds of matter. Then we find out the reasons of such behavior. Somebody may ask, why say? When we put sodium chloride into water, it, it easily dissolves, but in kerosene, it remains unchanged. And so we find out the behavior. And we could see that sodium chloride and water have certain characteristics. They are polar. When we go forward, we will look at what is polarity of compounds, what makes compounds to be polar. And then why naphtaline is not able to dissolve in water, but it is able to dissolve in kerosene. And we see that both compounds are nonpolar. And when we go forward, we will look at why certain compounds are considered as polar, others as nonpolar. And the third reason is our aim is that the knowledge that we gain, we put that knowledge into practical use. So, for example, if I want to prepare sodium chloride solution, I will not go for kerosene, but I'll simply go for water. If I want to prepare naphtaline solution, I will not go for water as my solvent. I will go for kerosene as my solvent. Because I have seen the behavior of these compounds in the two solvents and the reason of such behavior. And the aims are studied or achieved through analysis, experiment, and synthesis. So when we talk about analysis, what do we mean? When we talk about synthesis, what do we mean? So analysis simply means breaking down the substances to find out what combines together to make that substance. And synthesis involves the combination of these substances or smaller units to obtain a larger one. For example, Joseph Priestley identified or discovered oxygen when he heated mercury 2 oxide. And mercury 2 oxide, let's look at the equation for, we have HGO solid, he heated it to obtain AG liquid and then oxygen gas. So looking at this compound when he heated, he broke them into mercury and then oxygen. And this is an example of analysis to find out, breaking down that compound. And Lavoisier also combined the two smaller units to obtain a larger one. So Lavoisier heated this mercury and oxygen for a very long time and obtain the solid. And this is also this is an example of synthesis. So from the two, we have seen that they all did experiment. So both analysis and synthesis are done through experiment. An experiment helps us to answer so many questions. For example, somebody may ask, when we heat wool, or wool is bent in oxygen, what will be the product? Some will argue that you get ash. Others will say you get charcoal. So what do we do? We have to do experiment to find out whether we will get charcoal or you will get ash. And we see that depending on the supply of oxygen, two substances can be obtained. When we heat wood in open air, where we have a larger supply of oxygen, ash should be produced. But if you have visited some places where they manufacture charcoal, you see that they pack the wood and then they cover it with sand or soil. And then they leave some small holes that means they are limiting the supply of oxygen. And at the end, you see that 
wood will not completely bend, so you get charcoal. And so the experiment has helped us. And therefore, that is the behavior of oxygen or air and wood. So when we want to get ash, we know how to obtain ash. When we want to get charcoal, we know how to obtain charcoal. And these are all done through experiment. Now, chemistry has so many branches. And we want to look at uh, the branches that we studied at SHS level. And you go to university, you see a lot of branches. But here we are considering only three of these branches. The first branch we are looking at physical chemistry. Now when we talk about physical chemistry, we are dealing with a branch that deals with the general behavior of substances or matter. And it is concerned with the molecular structure of the substance. At times we talk about feasibility of chemical reactions. And what do we mean by that? Whether if I write any reaction, the reaction can take place or not, we call it as feasibility of the reaction. We also discuss about rate of reactions. How fast reactions okay? We look at mechanism of chemical reactions. When we talk about mechanism, what steps are followed from the reactant stage to the final stage to obtain the products? All these and others are studied under physical chemistry. We have second branch we call inorganic chemistry. And this part of chemistry or this branch deals with the study of elements other than carbon and then their compounds. However, there are certain compounds that contain carbon which conventionally we considered as inorganic chemistry. Example, if you carbon monoxide, there is a carbon. Carbon dioxide gas, there is a carbon. Bicarbonates, there is a carbon. Cyanide, there is a carbon, and other substances. So if I take sodium hydrogen carbonate, uh, though carbon is there, it is not uh, considered as organic, but we consider such compounds as inorganic, sodium cyanide. All these compounds are studied under inorganic. But we have one branch we call organic chemistry. This is a branch that deals with the chemistry of carbon and its compounds in general. Except those that we, I have already told you that we consider them as inorganic. And when we come to organic chemistry, we look at why certain compounds are considered as organic and they are compounds of carbon. We will look at the reasons why so such compounds are called organic uh, compounds. And these branches, the three branches that have already been this, uh, discussed are grouped into two and one is called pure chemistry. When we talk about pure chemistry, what do we mean? We try to get general understanding or meaning or knowledge of this, whether it is physical, inorganic, organic. When you make an attempt to get better understanding of it, and then we call it as pure chemistry. We have another we call applied chemistry. This one deals with the use of the knowledge of chemistry. Whether physical, inorganic, organic, the knowledge that you gain, you put them into practical use. Don't forget that I told you the aims of studying chemistry. So when you put this knowledge into practical use, it is called applied chemistry. In applied chemistry, we use the knowledge to produce goods and then to provide other services. What are some of these goods that we are talking about? Even the uniforms that you are wearing, all these are made by chemistry or because it is science. 
when you go to polymerization, you look at nylon, some buckets that we use. As you use them to take your bar to wash the buckets, rubber buckets, the polythene bars, when you go to market, you buy things, they put them in. They are all made through chemistry. And then if there is some pollution in a certain area or in river bodies or water bodies, how do we remove such problem? Recently, you saw that a car with battery fell in one of the rivers in the Brunafo region. They have to apply knowledge of chemistry to remove those batteries from the water bodies. Other than that, the aquatic life will be in danger. And so all these are the branches. Then we define chemistry as experimental study so that anything that deals with experiment we carry it in the laboratory. We don't do chemistry uh, as we are doing, though here we want to get the knowledge, but most practicals will be done in the laboratory. And so when we go to lab, <laughs> we are exposed to danger. Many, many, many chemicals are poisonous, others. So we have to observe some safety rules. Therefore, we are going to look at safety precautions in the laboratory. When we go to lab, there are certain things that we need to do to preserve life. Because you have to be more conscious about uh, what happens to you. If you go to lab and you are not careful and you try to do anything, you will harm yourself. So there are certain rules that we want to look at. And this will help us because most of the practicals will be done in the laboratory. Uh, as we are starting, when you reach a certain point, we have to go to lab to do certain practicals. And as we are starting discussing chemistry, we need to know certain uh, safety rules that must be observed in the laboratory. When we go to lab, we will take you to the lab one day. You see some chemicals and symbols are attached to them. And they have meanings and there are different chemicals. For example, when you look at this type of symbol, which deals, uh, the meaning is highly inflammable. At times when you see these petrol tankers going, you see the sign on them. Highly inflammable means that they can easily catch fire. And therefore, when you are dealing with this chemical, you have to be more careful. Example, if you take ethanol in the lab, you will see that symbol on it. Ita, you will see that symbol on it. There are other chemicals that have this symbol. There is a second symbol, as you see the cross, meaning harmful or irritant. Example is hexane. And then we have CHCl3, which is chloroform, the formula. Being the first time some of you are familiar with symbols and formulae, others we know. But don't be afraid. As time goes on, we will look at how do we obtain the symbols, how do we combine them to write the formulae of compounds. We have a third symbol which shows that it is corrosive. An ammonia, hydrochloric acid, Many uh, acids in the lab, sulfuric acid, for example, is very, very corrosive. Potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, all these compounds are corrosive. And so when we look at them and we see these symbols, it draws our attention to danger. We have oxidizing, and that is the symbol. You look at it carefully, highly inflammable, and oxidizing, they look alike, but for highly inflammable, there is no ring. But oxidizing, you can see that there is a ring there. And compound like potassium permanganate, hydrogen peroxide,
potassium, iodate, nitric acid, they are all oxidizing. And then we look at this symbol. You can easily see that uh, the symbol. Some students, uh, some non-science students will say Ogun Pusro. And wherever you go, you see this diagram, it threatens you. It reminds you of death. And that symbol indicates poison or toxic substance. So when you go to lab and you are given this compound, you see the symbol there. It means that you have to be careful. Other than that, uh, you okay yourself. So all these are symbols that are found on chemicals. Continue. When we go to lab, we have a lot of chemicals there. You will one day go there and assemble them so that you appreciate such compounds. Then, apart from these symbols, there are certain things that we want to look at. And one, we have to protect parts of our bodies when we go to lab by wearing laboratory coats, goggles. You see the laboratory coats there. You see hand gloves. You see goggles. All these are put on to protect parts of the body. And we know some compounds can easily uh, come up if you are not careful. It can splash onto your eyes. Then you have your school uniforms. And when you put on laboratory coats, and if there is any harm, you know it will protect your school uniform. These are some of the precautions that we take. And then when we are also in the lab, we need not to eat. So you have to be careful about don't go and bring any food to the lab. Don't go and bring any drink and say that, oh, I'm, we are going to class, so I'm going there to eat or to drink or to taste uh, any chemical in the lab. When you go to the lab, you don't eat because we have so many poisonous substances there. And if you go there with your food, uh, it can be contaminated. And when it gets into your body, you know the harm it will cause. We don't drink. In fact, there are certain chemicals, if you go to the lab and you see them, you appreciate, you will be tempted to taste. But you are putting poison into your body. So when we go to lab, we don't eat, we don't drink, we don't taste anything, except when you are allowed to do so. As for that, then we are allowed to do, uh, to taste something, you know that it will not harm you. But we don't do certain when we go to uh, school lab. Then we have to perform experiments with permission from laboratory instructors. Sometimes we are lab technicians. They are there. And we have to follow every instructions given to us because they are experienced. They are there. When we go to lab, don't think that the laboratory technician doesn't know anything, so you are going to show him that you are a student. No. We go there, we follow instructions given to us. And when we obey them, it will help us. And when we want to dilute acids, we add the concentrated acid to water, little at a time not acid to water. Why? Sometimes there will be explosion. And if you are not careful, I quite remember when we were at KNUST, certain students came to the lab. And one student was playing with some of the chemicals, and the boy nearly got blind because he tried to do whatever he liked. And he was adding, not knowing that the certain compound was acid and another was water. And the laboratory technician prepared certain chemical. He forgot to take them away. But when the boy added, 
Immediately there was an explosion. So we had to rush the boy to hospital. So when we go to lab, we are not going there to misbehave. We have to add acid to water little by little, little by little. And then not the water to the acid to avoid any harm or explosion. Then when we are asked to smell something, we don't put the thing closer to our nose because some gases are poisonous or some compounds are poisonous. Others are harmful. They can cause harm to us. So we try to hold it uh, about 20 centimeters from our nose and we use our finger or our hands. We wave it and we sniff carefully. We sniff carefully so that we preserve ourselves. So all these are examples of precautions that we need to do. Then, if we have something, assuming you are giving a compound, there is a label showing that it is highly inflammable, and there is a flame there. We don't bring that compound closer to the flame. When you bring it, it can easily catch fire, you know what will happen. We can easily burn the laboratory and even our source. So when we go to lab, we have to be careful about things that we do. So then if there is any fire outbreak, that one, it can even be in our houses or our homes, not only the lab. Though we are studying chemistry in the lab, but it can happen to us in the house. So if fire breaks out quickly, we have to turn off any gas or any electricity. When we are able to do that, at least we prevent the burning of that area. Now, when we are heating, we have to be careful. We don't point the mouth of the test tube to our cells or to our friends in the laboratory. When we, are, we do that, it will cause harm to them. And so students, when we go to lab, these are examples of safety precautions that we need to observe. When we are heating, we don't just hold the tin with our hands and then we put it in the flame. It will burn us or it will burn you. And so we have some test tube holders. We have pair of tongs. If we don't have any of this, at least we can get heat proof material like napkin or even your handkerchiefs. And so these are some of the precautions that we need to observe in the laboratory. Then any chemical that we will accidentally uh, drink when we come to titration, you will see that the laboratory technician or I myself will teach you how to pipette. And if you are not careful, you will drink. Because as for that, it's normal. Students, their first time of doing that, you see a lot of them. Uh, drinking the chemicals. But when, when that happens, what do we do? We take enough water. And the water is doing what? It is diluting it so that the effect will be minimized if any chemical falls on your material or your skin. Quickly, you wash it with water to help you. Then, when you go there, and you are preparing solutions. At times, you may be asked to prepare one or two solutions. Make use small amounts of substances to avoid waste and reactants which cannot be controlled. To avoid waste, that is the emphasis. We have to avoid waste. I've told you that when you go there, you have to be careful. If you are not careful, and then you just, oh, the chemical is there, so you begin to add, add, add. Some students are like that. When they see that the laboratory technician is not there, the teacher is not there, they will just add. 
We need not to do that. If you do that, it will not help you. Then, if there is any accident, you have to report. Don't just put it on yourself, say that you know, I won't tell the laboratory technician, I won't tell the teacher. No. That is why they are there. Tell them that this is what is happening to me. And when you are going out, you have finished your experiment, you have to tidy your place after experiment. Remember, there is no substitute for safety. Look at the diagram. When you make laboratory so dirty, so clumsy, you find it difficult even to do experiment, where to work. But when you arrange things carefully, it will help you, it will guide you. So anytime that you come, you see that you are happy that you are in the lab. So you have to observe safety rules. And students, today being the first time we have done introduction, at least you have seen that uh, chemistry is a science subject. As I told you, chemistry has improved life because almost much of our life depends on the results and application of knowledge of science. The food, this time you have a lot of drinks. All these are based on the knowledge of chemistry. We have so many uh, things around us. The water, this water, this water, all these are made by use of knowledge of chemistry. And we know that the importance of studying chemistry and that has helped us and then we also know the various branches that we study in SHS and you know chemistry is experimental subject studying in the lab and therefore safety of students and teachers and everybody that goes to the lab is very very important students thank you for listening to this introductory aspects of the chemistry and we meet next time to continue the study of the chemistry. Thank you, and we will meet again.